This is an interview with IGN about Tekken 8 that Harada gave, right? And there's a lot of stuff. You guys should check it out. Highly recommend it. Uh, but in it, some of the most interesting things that he gets to talk about <clears throat> is, you know, number one, they were working with Epic on this Unreal Engine 5. Uh, and let me find the part. He says, we've been working closely with Epic to figure out how to optimize some of those processes for input. So that was one of the big things, right? Because obviously when Tekken 7 came out on the PlayStation 4, uh, there was crazy amounts of input lag, right? And then now they've been gradually working, like they started on Unreal Engine 4 and they gradually started porting certain elements of the game over to UE5 and confirming the results, you know? So they were like, okay, the graphics on this thing are better. So the port is like a slow port, right? So it starts with UE4, obviously they probably wouldn't have started with UE5 directly, that doesn't make sense. Uh, but they are optimizing the input delay and stuff like that, right? So that's really cool. I think that was a very important thing. Uh, if you guys remember, there was a tweet a few months before EVO, I think it was, where it was like EVO said that they were working with Epic to reduce input lag for fighting games going forward and stuff too, right? So a lot of things in going that direction. You guys have seen Strive. Strive did a very good job with that as well. So that's awesome, right? Um, another thing that I thought was interesting, um, they were talking about the story. Basically, if you guys remember, the other day we were talking on stream about how Heihachi and, not Heihachi, Kazuya and Jin are fighting, right? And I was like, we don't know what part of the story this is, right? Like, do you guys think they're showing us the end of the story mode here? Like Jin and Kazuya are fighting the big showdown. You think they're gonna show us the end of it? That's the debut of Tekken 8 for us? Hell no, right? So I said, it's probably the start. And then right while they're fighting, Heihachi probably comes back to life or some shit, right? Look at this. So now we're showing everyone a pinnacle of the story from the start of the campaign. Look at that. From the start of the campaign, dude. Like I didn't know no, but I took an educated guess, right? So it's confirmed here that that clip we get to see is from the start of the campaign. Uh, showing the remaining Mishima, the two of them, the only ones left. And then you've got Jin Kazama and what he's trying to achieve, right? So, if it's from the start, right? Heihachi could or could not come back again. Personally, I hope he doesn't come back again. I hope that he's dead, at least for the entirety of Tekken 8. Bring him back in Tekken 9 or something if you want to bring him back. But keep him dead for this game. That's my, that's the way that I think would be more impactful for anyone, right? But... If that's the case, if Heihachi is dead, right? And we started looking or thinking down that path, then you're like, if Heihachi is dead and Jin and Kazuya are fighting at the beginning of the campaign, then where does that go, right? There's gotta be a story arc there. So it could be something like that a lot of people want. Like maybe Jun Kazama comes back. Maybe she's involved in the story, right? Do the ogres come back? Right? Like, I don't, I don't know what happens at this point. So, uh, regardless, I think that it's very interesting that this is from the beginning of the story. I think that's super duper cool, right? Um, this interviewer, whoever this interviewer was, I'm not sure his history with um, Tekken, etc. Right? But, you know, he, you know, he talks a lot about stuff that a lot of us would have asked. You know, uh, this was one of the questions about Rage, whether Rage Arts and Rage Drives are returning. And one of the things Harada talks about here is like, basically... You know, if you guys are Tekken fans, you know, if, you, if it was something from Tekken 7, odds are we're trying to keep it and make it better, basically. You know, so that's kind of the gist of it, right? <clears throat> but he doesn't really specifically say that anything is going to be there or not be there, right? Um, he says, uh, blah, 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 blah. Regarding Tekken 8, something that unfortunately we cannot talk about what's going to happen with the game mechanics today. That's something we hope people will look forward to at a later date. So... A lot of the interview goes like this where he can't really give details about future stuff, but, you know, they're working on what they've done in the past, right? Uh, and look and make it better. So, pretty crazy. Uh, also, there was something about arcades first. This. Will there be an arcade version before an updated console version like previous Tekken games, right? And Harada, he kind of dodges the question. He's like, unfortunately for the platforms, we can only talk about the ones that are announced right here. PlayStation 5, Xbox, Series X and S, and Steam. What we can say is that this is the first time in the history of the series 
that we've announced the console version first. So that in itself is quite notable, and that's all we can say at this point. So this to me is interesting because I feel like they are not going to do arcades like hella first, like they did with Tekken 7. But I still can see a future where it is going to come to arcades and it comes out like, you know, a few months before or something. Um, if they do that, then obviously they can get a little bit of testing in, get some day one patches in before it gets like released to the mass public, right? The downside of that, of course, is that that whole exploration phase is ruined, right? Like everyone just gets to watch it from Japan or whatever. Uh, and then you've just basically ruined the hype in that way. So it's a really shitty situation, right? Uh, so personally, I hope it's I hope, I hope it's console first. Like, just screw it. Like, get the patching done as best as you can and make sure it's good. You know, do whatever you can to make it good privately before the world gets to test it together. Um, obviously, you know, open betas and stuff is something that's been happening. That doesn't get talked about in this interview at all, but uh, I would love to know if like an open beta is a possibility even a closed beta right street fighter 6 has a closed beta test coming up uh just in like three weeks or something so uh and street fighter 6 is closed beta test if you guys haven't heard they are they're going all in it's a closed beta test that has cross play and a training mode and if you guys saw all the features they put in the training mode they have the uh frame data display they've got training for anti-airs like simplified training right so it's like you pick a setting that says you know train anti-airs and then all of a sudden the computer will randomly jump up and jump forward at you or just walk back forth and jump forward you know so it's training you specifically to anti-air right uh and that is super cool uh like in tekken if you imagine if you could do in tekken where you just said like practice throw breaking and then all of a sudden boom you get rip's throw break trainer in there and you're practicing throw breaks you know or if you said uh practice sidestepping against this character you know and then there's like you know three moves it does whatever and you can step the right way for each of those moves or something um, you know, to put you in a jab lockdown and then do the move after it. You got to guess, right? Um, so that that could be stuff to do, but that sounds like a lot harder to implement the one I just said about the sidestepping. But they could definitely do a throw break trainer if they decide to bring throws back, right? Uh, another thing that was interesting was this. Trailer seems to imply expanded slow-mos during actual game mechanics, not just at the end of the round. Uh, and he wanted him to comment on that, right? Because obviously, when I thought about it, I thought, we don't want slow-mos everywhere, right? Everyone wants it at the end of the round. Sure, it's hype there. But if you put it everywhere, you don't know what it's going to play out like. It might, like, totally throw off the momentum. Uh, and Harada says, you know, it looks cool to have slow motion during the matches, but you cannot just put it in whenever you want to because it looks cool. It gets in the way because it slows down the tempo, etc. So it's a really fine balance you have to achieve, and that's something that's not been fixed or, or locked in yet, so we can't say either way at the moment. I love that, like, Harada is thinking the same thing, right? Like... It's very important to have someone uh, who understands this part of it uh, because I feel like a lot of other developers may, may have been like, yo, slow mo, people love that shit. Put it everywhere, you know? Uh, but I love I love this, this response, it was perfect. Uh, and then customization. You know, this, this interview asked about tech and tag two levels of customization. Uh, and this was great. Haraz was like, it's an interesting topic because I was just joking that I should have never included customization it was included for Tekken 5 and I didn't think it was going to be such a thing until after it was released and everyone just really took to it. Uh, Tag 2 and Tekken 7 had a lot of options, but people still want more. We brought up that the people who want more sometimes build their own mods and customization is even crazier there. So it's amazing how much people are really into customizing. I have a theory that fighters like Street Fighter and others usually have just set skins because they saw what we have to do to development to develop customizations and how intensive it is on resources they're like no we're not going to do that so it sounds like there is a chance that there won't be customization going forward right um because it takes a lot of resources um and personally i've i've wanted them to drop it and go back to skins i feel like we get much cooler outfits that way uh, the fact that he brings up mods here is pretty interesting because he's kind of saying like maybe we don't do customization You guys can just do it yourself with mods, you know, <laughs> like you guys are gonna do it anyway uh, I don't know. I don't know what they're gonna do, but it, it definitely sounds like He's not in love with customization 
uh, and you know what it means in terms of development, etc. Right? Uh, like if you had to choose between having customizations or having team battle and Tekken Ball, I choose team battle and Tekken Ball every time. So yeah, this is a very good interview. And then also asked about the guest characters. You know, uh, he brings up an example of uh, the president of their company having their first time at EVO in Las Vegas here. Uh, you know, and he says he had one of those box areas, VIP seating, watch the first game. Normally he'd sit next to him and explain the players and the characters they were using, the strategy. But this time out of the blue, the president who used to work at Capcom was like, like, hey, cool, man. Akuma from Street Fighter, Geese from the SNK series, nice, you know? Uh, so Harada's like, uh, that's one of the things you gotta watch out for with guest characters, I suppose. Uh, I don't know what that means, like, in terms of how he feels about it. But basically, it sounds like everyone is happy with the guest characters. So uh, Harada seems like, what did he say here? It says, really satisfying for the team to work on. A win for us because they did quite well. Win for the fans because they got something brand new and different. Uh, win for the IP owners because they saw what we made and they saw the reactions from the fans and they were really happy about the results So everyone in general all around is quite happy with the guest characters and how they turned out for seven Which means I think that there's a good chance we get some guest characters in Tekken 8 uh, So yeah, this is a very very good read But yeah, other than that, you know, I think those are the most important things uh, He talks about Sakurai putting Kazuya into Smash Brothers. If you guys haven't seen Smash Brothers too, uh the Smash scene is all about Kazuya. They hate him <laughs> because he's so buff right now. Uh, but like they didn't even know who he was at first, you know? Uh, but it's interesting because they talk about the approach that Sakurai had uh, where they thought, you know, whenever they've gone to make a guest character, they're kind of like, yo, what do we got to do about this character? This and that. Uh, but when Sakurai uh, came in from Kazuya, he just came and was like, yo, I've played a lot of tech and study and this is what I feel is important for the game. And so he already knew what he wanted to do and he already had you know, brought in all these other characters into Smash. So he was, you know, um, very different. Uh, and see here, it's quite a shock in a positive way. Uh, made us think that he has all these characters with other franchises and games in Smash Brothers. So to know so much to a deep extent about all these characters, all these different IPs, to be able to do that, he's probably the only one that could probably make that game that way. Uh, so yeah, in Korean Tech Series, we always look at various different fighting games or other games outside the genre and think about what to maybe draw from that experience. But he's went so much deeper on all of them. We thought there's still a lot we can learn ourselves from different products outside of Tekken by looking at his example. So yeah, pretty neat, man. Pretty neat. Talked a little about Street Fighter 6 and how it's a good time for fighting games. Um, this was kind of interesting too, right? He says, uh, It's not like Tekken Street Fighter and the big ones are selling less copies nowadays. Oftentimes they sell more. It's just the impression of some of the fans that this is the case. And then there's other changes in the genre as well from a business model perspective. A lot of these titles were in the arcades. Then gradually we saw the titles that would not do an arcade release and would just go straight to console, right? So that's been how the entire FGC has moved over the years. So that shift of how do we go from an arcade game where you're putting in 100 yen at a time to selling a console version where it's like a full package that has everything, right? Uh, so there was a change that happened and now we're seeing, I'm quite interested in what's gonna happen with Riot Games Project L. Maybe there's another shift in the way fighting games with its business model. I don't think they've said it yet, but they typically do free-to-play titles. They did actually confirm that it's going to be free-to-play, by the way. So if they do that with Project L, which they are, how that will change writing games is something I'm quite interested to see what happens. And when it comes to free-to-play and fighting games, obviously there was like Killer Instinct, right? Killer Instinct was one of the first ones we saw do that. Uh, what's that Smash clone? Brawlhalla, I think it is. Uh, they're also free to play, I think. Uh, and now you can have Project L kind of do it. DOA tried a free to play model. It was kind of funky. The netcode is so bad that I didn't, I, even though I tried it, I didn't play it. I ended up buying uh, Jackie from Virtual Fire for the DOA game. And I didn't, I ended up just not liking, I liked the combo and liked the game, but I didn't like the netcode, so I couldn't play the game. Um, Project L, though, is very interesting, right? Because it's the one that we kind of assumed everyone else was going to have to look at afterwards. So the fact that Harada basically says as much as that, that says like, hey, I'm interested in what Project L is doing with it. I'm keeping my eye on it. Uh, it's very, very interesting, right? Because with Street Fighter VI, they've already shown us the roster now, right? Like you saw the, the stuff they released yesterday from TGS. They showed the whole roster that had leaked out before. And it's interesting. I feel like they did that now because of the leaks they had before that, right? Um, but Project L is such a big question mark. Because I feel 
Tekken 8 looks amazing, right? Street Fighter 6 looks pretty good. Project L now looks kind of dated in a way. So are they going to delay that game again? Like, it seems like it's just getting later and later every time it's not out. Um, it, it's a very, very weird situation. Uh, because people have been excited for it forever. We finally get to start seeing it. Then it looks completely different the next time we see it. And now it looks dated after all that. Uh, but it's Riot. People love Riot. It's going to have a huge player base regardless. Uh, Multiverses just came out, right? Multiverse is free to play as well. And the thing about Multiverses, obviously you guys have seen me streaming a bunch. Uh, I even commented at EVO, right? But Multiverses 2v2. So the interesting thing about that is you can be like, hey, friend. I want you to play this game with me, right? So you get your friend to play for free this free-to-play game with you. But if you do it with a game like Street Fighter or Tekken, it's 1v1, right? So now you're saying, hey, friend, would you like to play this game against me? It's free. Get it to play against me. I feel like that's always a harder sell, right? Uh, so Project L, I've been saying this from the beginning, that game should have been 3v3 KOF style, you know, or even 2v2 KOF style where you and a friend are playing versus two other people one at a time you know so you can talk to each other and be like yo he's gonna do this and that you know you take off the life bar now he's only got half life left for you to take out you know you want to play with your friends i think that would be much better but project l they made it 2v2 but it's like a tag game you know it's kind of like a tatsunoko vs capcom or something from what they've recently shown us so i don't know man i don't, I don't feel like project l is doing things in the best way but still gonna be free to play still gonna be interesting uh, we'll see how they do. But thinking about that, like for Tekken, like we talked about this a lot when, when uh, Tekken Revolution came out, right? Tekken Revolution was free to play, but they used that coin system. That coin system was terrible. But if it was, I don't know. If you, What do you guys think? I don't think it would work. I feel like Multiverses does well because you're asking a friend to play with you and it's got Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and Shaggy and Tom and Jerry and Bugs Bunny and all these different IPs, so the amount of people that are interested in it is so much larger than a singular game like Street Fighter or Tekken would be, you know? I feel like that's a, a very different, what do you call it, like base of people that you could pull in, you know, versus like a niche like Street Fighter or Tekken could pull in by itself, you know? Do you think tag mode could become a selectable mode in future Tekken instead of having separate games? I don't think so. I think, I think that if tag mode was ever going to become a separate mode, it would have been in Tekken 7, you know? I feel like Tekken 7 Tag is where that would have happened. It was the perfect buildup to make Tag just an extra mode to add in, right? It could have been Season 5 Tekken 7 Tag, right? But the fact that they are not doing that, they're going straight for Tekken 8, uh, I think means that we're not going to get a Tag game until the next game. Although, we've seen very little of Tekken 8. What if Tekken 8 is Tag? You know? I have no idea. What else did he say? Was there anything else in here? He just talks about how the consoles are very strong compared to the PC now. Because Harada's a PC guy, right? He's like, I'm a huge PC gamer. I actually like to build my own PC. Uh, but he said it's unfair that the consoles are that good at that price point. So basically, he's impressed with how strong the PS5 and the Xbox series are. Mm, talks about the risk. This is, all, this is obviously one of the big things too, right? So when you say that you're rebuilding everything from the ground up that's really ambitious and i'm wondering what are the pitfalls that you're trying to avoid to ensure that this goes as well as possible and obviously there's risk and pitfalls right around to gives a pretty solid answer to this most people have been working on a series for 10 or even 20 years they all have thorough knowledge of tekken uh, but no matter how much a veteran you are there's always fine balance that you have to break things in order to create something new right um, for example if we don't break it enough then people will be like okay it's not a brand new game, it's Tekken, it's a new season, it's just Tekken 7.5 or something. If we break it too much, then you might take away some of the elements that people enjoy from the franchise. This is the biggest issue currently, right? Uh, and if you, you read the rest of it, this is, I'll read the whole thing. Uh, it doesn't matter how much experience you have, that's always a very difficult task and no one has the answer to it. That's super important. No one has the correct answer for this, right? I don't have the answer. You don't have the answer. If you think you have the answer, you're wrong. You know, uh, you just never know what's going to happen. But going back to the point of this here, right? Uh, it's not a brand new game. It's tech and it's, an, it's just like a new season or 7.5 or something. I feel like currently, right? We haven't seen anything yet. 
like we've seen the combo structure that looks very similar but they've shown nothing else really right? we've seen like some animation change like the new guts done from kazuya's countering down for two is different right uh the way that they're rolling back and stuff and the ground is breaking like is that in there or is that just cinematic we don't know yet so we really still know nothing right um but when i've thought about this in terms of how much the games have changed one to an, one to the next that's where i have the concern because i asked you guys this maybe six eight months ago and i was like yo man what do you guys want to see in the next tekken right we've had wall bounce we've had this and that you know what is next to push tech to the next level right uh, and no one really had any big answers. So I feel like people really like Tekken 7. I think Tekken 7 has kind of hit the spot where it's like, this is Tekken now. You know, if you go back to Tekken 3, they kind of hit that spot back then. It was like, this is Tekken now. And then they went to Tekken 4 and they did like something drastically different. And everyone's like, yo, what the fuck? I already knew what Tekken was. And now you gave me this thing, which has the same people in it, but it's not the same, right? So I think it's better to do something similar to Tekken 7 than to do a Tekken 4 2, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I don't know, man. Definitely a hard question, but I think everyone's happy with with uh, what we've seen so far, right? So that's it. Anyways, that's basically it. Uh, accessibility he talks about some of the movement stuff. Uh, he talks about how you can hold a button and hit a shortcut attack, whatever. It also talks about how, you know, even if you put in accessibility controls for people, it's not going to help the new player out that much eventually at the end of the day you're going to um still have the better player winning right so accessibility only goes so far uh, he also talks about how in tekken you have moves like a death fish right where you can do a crouch dash and then hit the button right to like delay it and have farther forward travel with it uh that was really interesting like if you try to make that into a simplified input you're gonna lose that right so that's pretty interesting too I love how everyone misinterprets everything, right? Uh, from what I'm gathering, you don't intend to pursue accessibility features in Tekken 8? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Uh, let's see. When you look back on almost 30s of Tekken, I'm just wondering what kind of emotion it leaves you with and how that leaves you feeling as we head into Tekken 8. This is interesting, right? Because Harada has been with Tekken for 30 years. Uh, and in here, you know, he talks a little bit about how uh, for Tekken 7, it felt like my life's work. It could have been the last installment. So I had to make it the best it could be. That's wild, right? Can you imagine doing it like that? Uh, but then it was released and it did really well. And now it's like Tekken 8's got to be even better than Tekken 7. So there's no regrets from me or any of the staff in the team. It's something we constantly talk about. This could be it. So you better give it all you have. That is awesome. Super awesome. Tekken's crazy. I feel like all of us who have been playing it from the beginning, it's kind of like we've been on this ride with Torado. Like he's the one making it, right? The team there is making it for so long. Uh, but so many of us have been along that whole way, you know, it's it's, it's pretty pretty awesome that they still get to keep doing it and that they're still making it better. Um, that's awesome, dude. I, I can't say anything but awesome for it. You talk often about how this is a story that's been almost 30 years running. Have you imagined an ending to it? Do you have an ending in your head? So this is cool too. Harada says that he had an ending way back in 96, but the development pace of games slowed down over time and then more people joined the team and they had more and more stuff that they were like, yo, we should do this and that. So the actual ending kept on getting pushed further back and then they had the guinness book of world records thing where it was like hey man uh did you know that you guys are the longest running continuous series or whatever so because of that he's like okay well i want to keep this i don't want to let any other game take over that record so we have to make the story continue uh so it's pretty funny how that affects everything right so maybe the ending that he originally had will get to see it one day and then it will continue running so they can keep the guinness record you know but yeah, this fantastic read, you know, I kind of gave you guys a brief overview of the whole thing right now, the part that stuck out to me the most. Uh, but if you guys are interested in knowing more about Tekken 8 and Harada and everything they're doing with Unreal Engine 5, etc., I definitely recommend giving it a read. I will give you guys the link one more time. If you guys are watching on YouTube, it's in the description below. And if you guys are watching YouTube, make sure you guys click the notification button. I know a lot of you guys are watching right now on Twitch, too. If you guys are YouTube subscribers, dude, please... Click the notification button along the subscribe button. Such a good stream, isn't it, though? <laughs> Mission Mike Groove. Thank you, man. Uh, but yeah. Boom.